Hey everyone, I am so excited to be here today. My name is Shawnee Watkins, and I am the owner of Agency of Joy, a queer-owned consulting agency specializing in digital storytelling. And this is my story. It's just not working out anymore. A line that might trigger a negative feeling from a lot of us in this room, and those of you watching online. Whether it's coming from a partner or a boss, hearing it usually doesn't mean anything good. Well, that was a line delivered to me by my program director one bright fall day in 2014. I was 24 years old, less than two years out of college, and living the dream I had at the time to work in a nonprofit where LGBTQ plus justice was my focus. The program's mission was to reconcile Christian faith and religion with LGBTQ plus identity and life. And I was contracted to be the consulting editorial assistant. It was my job to manage the program's website and social media, and my performance was never less than outstanding. At my six-month review, my program director and senior editor both commended me on how well I was doing. In that short time, I had already made them jump for joy when a graphic I created went semi-viral after actress and transgender rights activist Laverne Cox reshared it on her Instagram. They extended my contract and approved me for the raise I put in for. So, when my boss, a dark-haired, white gay man in his 50s, called me to an office and said, it's just not working out anymore, and to leave before I could finish my work day, I couldn't believe it. And when I asked why, his next words were said with such a sharpness I can still hear today. Either you're playing dumb and you know, or you really don't know and I just don't care to explain it to you anymore. And that was that. As I realized what was going on, I looked out into the rest of that 11th floor office to see the faces of people who would no longer be my coworkers. Then, I packed up my belongings one last time, saying as little as I could until I reached a street downstairs where I would call my mom to tell her what happened, while the rage and tears I was feeling finally began to spill out. I had just been fired from my first professional job out of college without any notice or explanation. This all happened in the start of September, my favorite time of year in New York, when the energy around the city, like the air of a changing season, seems to burst with new energy everywhere. But after that conversation with my boss, the world was turned off. The potential energy of the afternoon robbed in a moment's notice. Before I was fired, I had believed my program team could do no wrong. But as I thought back on my experiences there that summer, a couple stood out. I had been getting called into more meetings with my program team, the most memorable being the time I was politely asked by two queer and Christian bosses of mine to not publicly disclose that I'm agnostic when working, going so far as to say that people might not trust the brand if it came out. Not only did I disagree with this completely, but I was also hurt that my spirituality was being used against me, the same way conservative Christian clergy use theirs to deny queer, trans, and non-binary folk of our humanity. Now this is a thing the program was working to change. Another time, I was told they didn't agree with the decision made by our executive director to make me the youth representative to the United Nations, another dream role of mine. That is me standing in the Rose Garden of the New York United Nations headquarters. And as you can see, my joy was through the roof. But looking back on it, it seemed like every success I was having on my own that summer was being perceived as a threat by these two. And because I was brought in on the terms of a consultant, not a staff person, it would be an easy fix to replace me. The good thing about the story, though, was that this was not the end of the road for me. As my career has evolved into more than I've ever dreamed of, I've learned through both my own experience and through the story shared with me by so many, that for populations of color, and especially queer and trans folk, there seems to be an unspoken culture at large that's holding many of us back from having an authentic seat at the table. Its name is white supremacy culture. Now, while it's been proven that the danger of white supremacists is rising, many of us in the United States still only associate white supremacy with neo-Nazis sporting swastikas for fun, white people storming the U.S. Capitol, 
or the attacks of places of worship. But turns out, white supremacy culture is so widespread, it can show up in everyday workplace or classroom settings. For every microaggression, when you think your race, religion, sexual orientation, or gender is the cause, well, there's language that exists to challenge this dominant culture we're all born into. In their 2001 workbook, Dismantling Racism, a workbook for social change groups, Kenneth Jones and Tema Akun list out 11 traits of white supremacy culture in the workplace. Today, I will introduce three of these, which I think are most important to know. The first is power hoarding, which they define as those with power feel threatened when anyone suggests changes in how things should be done in a company or organization. Now, this is the case because, as Jones and Akun tell it, any suggestions for change are seen by those in power as a direct reflection of their own leadership skills. And now, I've seen this occur in many progressive institutions, especially ones where the director or, or the CEO happens to also be the founder. Admittedly, this can be a challenging position. You know, to keep yourself open to constructive criticism for an entity that they created. That said, change should always be seen as inevitable, and challenges to leadership can be healthy and productive. Without this being understood and named, it can be easy for a new employee, especially one who is of color and maybe queer, trans, or non binary, to feel discouraged to share any ideas that might call for change. Another trait of white supremacy culture is the fear of open conflict, which Akun and Jones define as people in power equating the raising of difficult issues with being impolite, rude, or out of line. This is a trait I've also seen play out way too many times to count. In one personal experience, I was in Paris working around the 2015 UN climate negotiations. Now, at a dinner with colleagues from around the world, I was racially profiled by an American couple sitting next to our table. I was the only black American at the dinner, and this couple would not stop staring at me until I asked them not to. Upon communicating this request for respect, a colleague of mine said that I was rude for doing so, for asking people to respect my humanity. According to her and white supremacy culture, I was rude for raising the issue, not the couple for treating me differently than the rest of my dinner party. The last trait I'd like to point to today is the right to comfort. Now, Akun and Jones define this as a belief that those with power have the right to emotional and psychological comfort. And this, this is a big one, because in other words, it's saying that logic is more valuable over emotion. In that same scenario of me in Paris, one could argue that my colleague simply wanted her right to comfort that night. She didn't want to have to have a conversation about race and the covert and subvert racism I was experiencing, especially in a public restaurant. It was easier to name me rude from within her purview instead of welcoming discomfort to possibly deepen her understanding and awareness of systemic racism and oppression. Now, in their analysis, Akun and Jones stress how all 11 traits of white supremacy culture are damaging to everyone both to black and people of color, as well as white people. But more importantly, they spell out how workplaces unconsciously use these norms and standards without being proactively named or chosen by the group. In other words, we're playing a game we didn't know we were playing. I didn't know any of this language some years ago. So when I lost that job, a job I loved, it hurt my soul. And I would later discover that like shattered glass on the floor, remnants of that trauma would show up in me for years to come. When I landed my next job several months later, I would have anxiety about every little thing I did, thinking I was always one step away from being fired. The job after that, I was so committed to my own self that I started to see how white supremacy culture was showing up in me. I was so committed to my own success above all that I started to lack accountability and drove myself into isolation. Because don't get it twisted, Jones and Akun explain it that black and people of color can demonstrate traits of white supremacy culture as well. 
It took almost four years after that first job of mine to be introduced to this language of white supremacy culture in the workplace. Until then, I still only talked about the stresses of my work as just that, random, disconnected events that seemed to follow me as a Black person working in primarily progressive white spaces. I had a yearbook's worth of experiences, but as my way of coping, I always swept them under the rug, reducing it down to, well, shit white people do. My way of providing comedic relief after a long day, week, month, or year of dealing with stress at work. For Black people and many populations of color, we're taught from an early age how we have to work twice as hard just to be seen equal to a white person doing the same thing. And while I am proud of my generation for how we continue to push the boundary of what's acceptable, as I've learned from my therapist, the work is never really done. Giving something a name gives it power. Now, whether good or bad is up to us once we remain self-aware. But as culture is so hard to define, having a tangible resource with definitions and examples like what Jones and Kuhn have so beautifully provided can go a long way. Language is powerful and intentional, and it's our duty to use it as a tool to empower those around us, those of you who I know are still shining within the shadows. For me, learning there was a defined language with named traits for the same kind of experiences that I faced in my early career felt like receiving a thousand hugs at once. Finally, the healing could begin. After years of internal battles, thinking that I was wrong or undeserving of success, I now start to regain that self-confidence I lost over all those years. And more importantly, I could now look back on that first job of mine without feeling all of that pain from that September day. I could finally come to terms with how that programming team, while saying they wanted to be diverse and multicultural, really only allowed other people and cultures to come in if they adapted or conformed to what they wanted. Now, as I healed, I was able to begin owning my full self again, my beauty and the imperfections. The more I stepped into that, the more I became who I am, and the more success I had on my own. After building a career for myself within the climate justice space as a social media director, in 2018, I no longer wanted to be tied to the restraints of one single employer. By then, I had been working nonstop for years and had saved enough money to quit my job and take some time off. Two months later, my company, Agency of Joy, was born. Now, I am my own go-to for social change-driven leaders, organizations, and companies looking to build their online engagement, storytelling, or begin a culture shift within. Becoming, and now being an entrepreneur, has been quite the dream of venture. As a company, we've worked with over a dozen clients and partner organizations, mostly led by Black women or women of color, to advance social justice through their work, art, community, and more. And on top of that, I've been able to grow and support a phenomenal team of Agency of Joy project consultants, who I match with me depending on each project. And those are some of those shining faces right there. As a queer and black business owner, everything I do at Agency of Joy seeks to challenge white supremacy culture and invoke culture shift. It requires courage to be vulnerable, both with my clients, my team, and myself. But it's worth it. From leading with love and still having boundaries, saying no and being okay with it, creating a joyful space for collaboration, trusting my gut and knowing when to ask for help. These are the traits of the better world I envision, and it's what I'm most proud of. Now, while my career hasn't been success after success, understanding white supremacy culture as something we're all born into and must actively dismantle and challenge has dramatically impacted how I view myself and the impact that I have. I think about those of you watching home at home, those of you here right now, and I know that you've experienced traits of white supremacy culture, whether you knew it or not. 
when your professor or boss wouldn't accept your amazing idea unless it was written out in a specifically formatted memo. When you're dismissed simply because you display feelings or emotions. Or when those in power are so afraid of conflict, especially around race, that they try to ignore it or avoid it altogether. I know too that you can feel uncomfortable or even unsafe to address microaggressions like this in the moment. But thanks to the work of Tema Okun and Kenneth Jones, for starters, there is definitions and examples that affirm these one-off occurrences and connect the dots to how people and organizations use these norms and standards, making it difficult, if not impossible, for queer, non-binary, and trans, black, and brown folk like you and I to be our full selves. Because the thing about white supremacy culture in this country, especially now, is that its goal is to maintain false narratives. It's about lifting up stories that present a picture not based in truth, not based in a vision of joy for all, but in the protection of maintaining whiteness as the standard. That's why it's so important we're aware of these traits. Because that self and cultural awareness is important from there, you can then be empowered to make changes. To those of you here today and those of you watching online, I see the potential in you all to be your own agents of joy, owning the multifaceted parts of yourself and challenging white supremacy culture in your own authentic way. I see faces beaming with light, love, and tremendous opportunities. I see possibilities for yourselves that weren't even possible just five, 10 years ago. I see a world where the culture of white supremacy that got us here is disrupted. A world where being our whole selves is the new norm. We didn't talk about white supremacy culture in that first job of mine. I can't say I wouldn't still have been fired had I known those traits now, but I definitely might have saved myself years of insecurity, self-doubt, and shame that would hold me back from my true potential, my true joy. We owe it to ourselves to work at our highest frequency, and often that starts in the work or school environment we're in. The time to be aware of white supremacy culture is now, especially in work in higher education settings. Whether it's in a one-on-one meeting with your supervisor, leading in HR training for your team, or just studying a Coney Jones' work for your own self-assessment, being aware of and naming this culture of white supremacy will help more of us get to that better world I believe is possible. Thank you.